Hello guys, this is Tune Area. I'm an artist producer and filmmaker based in Seoul, South Korea. I've been filming a lot of projects and filmmaking videos, so make sure to check them out and subscribe to my channel. After the success of Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, which still sells faster than it can be produced, many expect Blackmagic to come up with something new in 2019 NAB show in order to replace their flagship camera, the Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K. Not necessarily because it's needed, but just out of curiosity to see new gear with added performance and functionality. People, for example, love the dual ISO capability of the Pocket 4K sensor, which offers increased low light performance. So it's only natural to expect something similar in a flagship camera with a larger sensor and high dynamic range. Besides, companies like RED and ARRI and even some of the smaller newcomers like the Kinefinity and Zcam have presented cameras uh, with a large uh, format sensor close to what is known as full frame in photography. Blackmagic is well known for being disruptive to the cinema camera market and many times out of nowhere presents cameras with high specifications at a bargain price. So people have been speculating and wishing for Blackmagic to step in with a flagship camera using a high-performing dual ISO large format sensor and able to film at 6K or 8K. The introduction of Blackmagic RAW last year was a good indication that they are probably working on such a camera. The bitrate required for 6K and 8K RAW content, especially in high frame rates, would be prohibiting without significant compression, something that cinema DNG format would not offer without a serious impact in image quality. It seems though that camera is not here yet and I'm sure Blackmagic is working hard behind the scenes in order to present something in the future which will be as disruptive as what the first cinema camera 2.5K, the Pocket Cinema Camera, the Ursa Mini 4.6K or the recently released Pocket Cinema Camera 4K was. All of those cameras were almost unbelievable when they were first announced, especially at the price they were announced. Meanwhile, instead of increased resolution, Blackmagic Rose higher compression options allowed Blackmagic to work on something different, ultra high frame rates. Instead of presenting a totally new camera, they decided to replace uh, the current Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K with an upgraded uh, Mark II version, which they named Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K G2 or G2 for short. The camera was presented in March, a little before 2019 NAB show, in a simple Blackmagic update video that is typical with the company featuring Blackmagic CEO Grant Petty. Let me emphasize at this point that this is not a brand new camera release which is made to be sold in parallel to the first Ursa Mini Pro. It's a replacement for the first Ursa Mini Pro, meaning the old model is out of production and the only Ursa Mini Pro for sale is the G2. This means that the camera does not need a new production line and can therefore be produced immediately at the same quantities the older Ursa Mini Pro used to, so since the camera is sipping already, there should not be too hard to get one. Despite the improvements, the camera is offered at the same price tag of $5,995. I think this confirms Blackmagic Design's mission statement of creating great gear for filmmakers without trying hard to maximize profits, as they could easily keep the older model in circulation for a bit and charge more for the G2, something we see a lot from other companies. Of course, you can still pick the older Ursa Mini Pro while the old stock lasts. Uh, perhaps at a better price, uh, some retailers started offering some really nice bundles, in some cases with uh, V-mount batteries and in uh, some other cases including the Ursa Viewfinder, which costs $1,495. You can also see the effect that the G2 has on the used market, as many people that are currently upgrading to the G2 are trying to sell their older Ursa Mini Pro cameras, uh, creating a competition that is driving the used uh, price lower and lower. The G2 carries most of the characteristics of the first Ursa Mini Pro, like the user exchangeable mount, the ENG style body with uh, many external controls, the internal ND filters, and so on. At the same time, it offers some additional features and improvements. In other words, if you were considering getting an Ursa Mini Pro before, you get all these additional improvements for free. If you already got an Ursa Mini Pro and you are considering upgrading to the newer model, perhaps this will be helpful so you can determine whether the new features and improvements are important to you. What is new though? compared to the first Ursa Mini Pro. The sensor of the camera is a refined version 2 of the 4.6K sensor used on the Ursa Mini 4.6K and the Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K. Coupled with uh, brand new electronics, it offers uh, better performance and higher capabilities. Some of those capabilities are the higher frame rates as well as the rolling shutter speed which has been measured to be about half of the previous Ursa Mini Pro. This is something very significant which puts this camera amongst the fastest in terms of rolling shutter in the camera market and it can have a positive impact in the overall 
feel of the motion, something that I find it to be the highlight of the G2. Another addition is the recording through the USB-C port, which can offer a cheap MIDI solution for those looking to record at the highest settings without having to acquire an external SSD unit, the expensive CFAST cards or high data rate SD cards. The camera also comes with improved audio with new electronics for the XLR inputs for quieter recording and line level adjustment. The color science is also a slightly new version with Blackmagic RAW version 1.3, which includes a nice feature for embedding loots in the files non-destructively. There is also an improved black shading for the sensor, which includes pixel remapping, something that some people that may have stuck pixels on their cameras will appreciate a lot. Finally, there's some interface and functionality improvements like the touch to focus function, one third stop ISO increments, an improvement formatting menu, and other small refinements. I suspect that some of the interface features and perhaps the new Blackmagic Grow version could possibly be carried on to the older version of the Ursa Mini Pro as well through a firmware update. After reading people's uh, reactions and questions about the camera, I wanted to talk a bit more in detail about the sensor found in G2. There seems to be a misunderstanding about the word new and people wonder what this new sensor can do. People are asking how is the image like, how is the low light, how about the dynamic range and so on. So to answer it all, this is not a new sensor design, it's a version 2 of the same 4.6K sensor. It means it has similar characteristics but it's refined to be able to have a faster readout and take advantage of the new electronics in the camera. So while image characteristics uh, remain similar to the 4.6K sensor that we have seen in the previous models of the camera, there are some important improvements. First of all, this camera films only Blackmagic RAW and ProRes. When Blackmagic uh, first made Blackmagic RAW available for the Ursa Mini Pro, people have reported cleaner images with less noise, slightly higher dynamic range and a more pleasing image overall. All these characteristics are of course carried on to the G2. Something that is reportedly new though in the 4.6K version 2 sensor found in G2 is an improved color filter array. The color filter array is a mosaic of tiny color filters that are placed over the image sensor in order to capture color information. It's also referred as the Bayer filter. I don't know the exact technical details of this improvement and how significant is the difference compared to the older 4.6K sensor, but in theory this should present us with a cleaner and more accurate color information in the image. I don't know on the older Ursa Mini Pro anymore, but from the footage I'm seeing coming out from the G2, I do indeed perceive an inherent cleanness in the image, uh, much more than what I was used uh, with the Ursa Mini Pro. Another thing that has changed of course is the readout time of the sensor. To me that's one of the major benefits of the G2, not just because any Rolly Sutter artifacts are gone, but because I believe the overall look of the motion is affected very positively. This is such an important topic that in my opinion brings the G2 to the level of the cameras up there and it's the main reason that I believe upgrading to the G2 is really worth it. Perhaps the most asked question about the G2 is how does it perform in low light? The short answer is that I'm very happy with G2's low light performance and I didn't have any problems in my shoots. I feel that this is a similar situation with the micro cinema camera which had the same sensor as the first pocket cinema camera but with better cooling and electronics giving it an advantage with better noise performance. In the same way, the G2 also seems to me to have some advantage over the Ursa Mini Pro. But this is a very complicated issue as what a clean image is can be very subjective and also people's expectations and shooting conditions can be very different. On top of that, people might have different shooting or post-production techniques or always shoot in more favorable conditions than others. Taking all that into account, we have many people that find the first Ursa Mini Pro low light capabilities totally fine as expected and others that report difficulty in getting clean images and under some conditions or bringing up all that old discussion about fixed pattern noise. The easy thing to do of course is to blame Blackmagic Design and claim that some of the cameras have faulty sensors. To my subjective experience though, it seems that always the more professional people that are more familiar with cinema cameras who report no problems at all in low light. Then I see so many posts in the groups and forums with uh, people complaining about noise and FPN, but when they upload their files for everybody to see, it's almost always a severely underexposed shot which was lifted in post. On top of that, most of these people didn't even perform a sensor calibration before shooting or they seem to misunderstand a lot about uh, how to expose properly or what the ISO does in this camera for example, revealing a trend towards uh, user error rather than actual sensor problems. Problem. I know very well because I felt like that when I got my first cinema camera and everything looked so noisy and unappealing 
until I gain the understanding of how to shoot properly. So whether it's user error or different expectations between users, the only thing that's true is that the 4.6K sensor is totally capable of great low light filming and the improved sensor in the G2 seems to perform even better. Since this is a really great matter, I have decided to address it separately on its own as well. I also explain what are the best practices for exposing and go through some different techniques that can always give you a clean image. So if low light is a major concern for you, and especially if you're getting FPN in your images, make sure to check it out. The G2 pad is identical to the first Ursa Mini Pro and is therefore compatible with all the accessories that have been released so far like the solder mount, the viewfinder, the PL and Nikon mounts and so on. This is obviously a full-scale cinema camera that is meant for produced content with some kind of plan. This could be a feature film, a music video, a documentary, some fashion shoot, uh, even a wedding and other events or news gathering and broadcast which Blackmagic has put uh, quite an effort towards too with this camera. It's not exactly the greatest camera though to take to your vacation or film your video log and your friend's skateboarding action outdoors and that's mainly due to its size and weight. The body weighs 2.3 kilos and a typical battery solution can weigh another kilo itself. Add a lens, perhaps a solder mount or some kind of grip and you're easy well over 4 kilo. Now that might sound quite a weight but for its purpose and category it's not really regarded that heavy. It actually weights the same as an Arri Alexa Mini or a RED camera body. The good news is that Ursa Mini Pro already includes includes all these connectors, functions and controls and a monitor at this weight, so you won't really need to rig it up much further to control it. The camera is perfectly functional as it is for almost any use. The weight also helps a lot with getting very steady and natural uh, handheld and solder shots. With a hand grip handle on the side it feels uh, really solid and uh, ready to film just like a typical camcorder. I usually just rest it a bit on my body or my solder and control the weight a bit with my left hand that is uh, usually holding the lens focus. I have always tried to leave my cameras as stripped as possible as I know that practicality is always much more important than some function that I might not really need. At this form I haven't felt it's any tiring at all but if you start building it up further with a solder mount, an EVF, a rail system, a follow focus, a matte box, extra monitor, wireless transmitters and so on, you can easily reach double the weight or even more and in that case things will be quite more tiring but uh, that's the case with any camera anyways. The camera can be turned easily on and off with a mechanical switch. It takes about 8 seconds to boot up in ready to shoot state and it turns off instantly. When changing between Blackmagic RAW and ProRes, a small reset is also happening internally that lasts about 5 seconds. You don't need to have the screen open to turn the camera on and off and there is a small LCD screen outside with the current settings and status of the camera. There are a few more controls on the outer side of the door including audio settings and levels, auto iris and autofocus and a playback menu which can be very useful in case you have an external monitor connected and you just want to play back some clips without opening the internal monitor. There are four ways to initiate recording, two are using the recording buttons located in the front section and inside the camera. The other way is by touching the record button on the monitor or triggering recording externally using something like a hand grip with lung control. You can find many controls on the body of the camera for many different uses, especially for news gathering and broadcasting. As a filmmaker of more produced content, I find myself using more the front section of the buttons. Here using this mechanical leverage you can change the ISO in one third stops, uh, the shutter angle or speed and the white balance. I find those really useful and intuitive especially on documentary event or fashion shoots that I just want to capture a moment very quickly and just want to change the setting without going through the camera's menu. What's even more useful to me though are those three buttons below the levers. The first two are the function buttons that are assignable to different functions. I have the first set to clean feed so when I just want to see what's going on without any indication, zebras or focus picking I can get there in one press. It's also very useful when I don't have an external monitor and I just want to play back quickly something I just film and I want to check it out if it was alright, sometimes with a client that of course they don't want to see all those focus picking and zebras going on. I have the second button assigned to force color which is a very helpful uh, and accurate exposure tool. There's also a histogram on the inside monitor of course. Finally there is the high frame rate button which switches between your project frame rate and 
whatever you have selected as high frame rate. In order to change the high frame rate setting, of course, you will have to go to the monitor. Mind that in the G2, the high frame rate button can be actually used as a third function button and you can assign something else if high frame rate is not something you often use. You can actually disable all of these buttons completely if they bother you and you can even lock the whole section uh, with uh, this mechanical switch. There is a whole section of controls and buttons as well in the inner part of the camera including the menu button which is necessary to access some of the settings. Many of the settings can be changed simply by touching the screen. I did a very detailed video about this operating system on my Pocket 4K review. It's almost identical, so if you want to know more about it, you can check out that video. You can find out about some specific functions as well, like how the focus picking or the zebras work and so on. In fact, since this pad is the same as the first Resume Mini Pro, you can watch any video that explains its operation and you will get the idea. At the right side of the camera, you can find some hardware connections. There are two SDI outs. The front one outputs in HD and it's uh, usually used uh, with a viewfinder and the one at the back which outputs 4K. There are also SDI in and time code, 12 volt input and output, as well as a headphones output. There is even a lens port in the front for controlling some kind of broadcast lenses. On the top we can find the two phantom powered XLR audio inputs that according to Blackmagic they're improved from the previous model with uh, less noise and better quality. I'm using this rosette mount for the hand grip here but you can use it for pretty much anything you find appropriate. There are also screw threads on the top and the bottom where you can install the solder mount or the top handle and EVF and so on. If you're planning to use the camera with batteries you must make sure you also get a battery plate as those do not come in the original package. V-mount and gold mount plates are available from Blackmagic and once installed they are very secure. They have a 12 volt DTAP output which can be very useful for powering external devices like monitors. The hand grip also doesn't come with a G2, something that is different than the first Ursa Mini Pro so if you need one you have to get it separately. The camera comes with an EF mount but you can change it easily to an affordable price PL, Nikon or B4 mounts to fit your purposes without having to send your camera back. You can see these gaps here for the air vents and the cooling system of the camera. You can still hear the fan of course but it has never been loud enough to me to really worry about. I've also used the camera in light rain and snow and I didn't experience any problems but of course uh, this is not a weather sealed camera and you should try to protect it from the weather. Reading the reports from the first Ursa Mini Pro camera, I highly doubt the camera will experience any kinds of problems even in hot environments and after hours of continuous operation. One of the highlights of this camera is that it includes ND filters internally, so when you want to change your exposure without changing the iris of your lenses, you can simply apply one of the three levels of the ND filter by turning the ND filter wheel and you are ready to go. There are three levels of ND filtration, two, four and six stops. Having internal filters like this is something very positive. It's almost like having a permanent variable filter, but you also have a clear position and of course you don't have to screw it on and off on your lenses. The only other option to have ND filter in would be the addition of a matte box which can add a lot of weight and bulk to the camera or with screw on filters that can become very bothersome to screw on and off. You have to have all your lenses at the same thread size and of course they can get stuck on and damage your lens threads, especially when using steel lenses that are not really made for rapidly switching filters. The quality of the internal filter is very good without color casts and the proper IR filtration for the sensor, something that many people using external ND filters sometimes struggle with. Of course having ND filters internally not only means you don't have to bother much during shooting, it also means you're saving some good money since you don't have to purchase matte box boxes, rail systems, high quality external ND filters and the R-cut filters required with many of those. You get a small indication when you have an ND filter applied on the top left uh, corner of the screen. On the G2 model the ND filter level indication actually stays on as long as it's enabled, something that perhaps uh, will be added to the original Ultra Mini Pro as well through a firmware update. Generally, I find the camera of good build quality, I don't see any differences in that matter compared to the first Ursa Mini Pro. The monitor might feel slightly unstable, but that's not because of chip construction, but rather how it opens and tilts at the same time. I'm personally a very gentle user of my gear, I don't film projects day by day, I don't lend my gear to anybody, so to me this is a more than adequate and it could last me a very long time. I can see some more clumsy users perhaps trying something they should do, like uh, pushing the screen too much or turning the dials hard or pulling the XLRs without uh, pushing the release lever or hitting the screen hard to change the setting faster or 
uh, packing the camera a bit roughly or dropping it a bit and so on. In all of those cases, it is not unlikely you would end up breaking something, but the normal average user should have a good experience overly. That said, everything works well and as intended, and if something doesn't, make sure you connect Blackmagic before you post those frustrating hate threads on the groups and forums, since they will be very happy to just fix it or replace the camera for you in a very short time. These were generally my first thoughts and impressions from uh, using the new Ursa Mini Pro G2. It's not easy to talk about every aspect of the camera in one go and that's why I have decided to talk about some specific topics separately instead. Make sure to check them out for a complete understanding of the camera and what it can do for you. Thank you for watching and see you next time!